Hello, Milkweed Nation. Welcome back to Grow Milkweed Plants podcast. Today is Monday, February 20th. We're going to pick right up where we left off. After a 15-minute break, you had a choice to either talk to the other friends at your table or use the bathroom. Um, Not a lot of time. This is a really action-packed event. Um, The speaker that resumed right after our uh, 10-15 break was... Gail Morris, Southwest Monarch Study Coordinator, Divergent Migration Destinations and Overwintering Strategies on Monarchs in the Southwest. Uh, Dr. Gail Morris has been collecting data on monarchs in the Southwest region of the United States for decades, I believe. And the data that she's been collecting is extremely interesting for the most part we have determined that uh, from her research southern arizona tag recoveries have a split migration some going to mexico some going to california the split is about 50 50 50 percent of monarchs from southern arizona based on tag recoveries, that little sticker tag on the wing, half of them go to Mexico and join the Eastern Monarchs, and about half of them go to California and are found um, in the Western wintering sites. We have um, su- uh, believe that to be true, I suppose. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the East and West, but uh, nowhere is it more... Uh, split 50-50 than southwestern Arizona, or southern Arizona, sorry. So Gail Morris has working is working with uh, MLMP training, which is the Monarch Larvae Monitoring Program. And the, the training program is not just um, to uh, educate people, although it does that. It actually meets a lot of criteria that open up pathways to expanding tagging in California. Um, There's uh, basically two pathways. Um, The first is um, with Monarch Larvae Monitoring Program training, you could apply for permits for tagging only. Now, tagging only can mean a lot of different things. Um, Tagging only could be um, like tagging monarchs in your own property, or it could also mean tagging monarchs that you see in the wild, like using a butterfly net, Um, or it could mean um, tagging monarchs on state property. So there's a lot of different tag only options. And then uh, uh, another option that I'm not sure was discussed is there's sometimes tagging programs at wintering sites because although you might tag a monarch that he closes in your, your property in, in the Western United States, say in Utah, and then have a recovery down in San Luis Obispo. There's also a question of where do the monarchs go from San Luis Obispo? Obviously they're probably heading back to um, Salt Lake city or anywhere else in the West, the Southwest or Oregon or Washington. But if you tag the monarchs at the wintering sites, you get an idea where that first generation is able to travel to during their spring departure from the wintering sites. So she's working on pathways to expand tagging in California. And I hope that program is successful. So the second portion of um, the second pathway to tagging in California includes Monarch Larvae Monitoring Program Tagging, plus OE sampling, and releasing those monarchs. So what that would mean is not only are you tagging the monarchs, but you're also taking a tape sample, which is pretty easy to do. You, um, you have to handle the monarch briefly, and then you put um, basically scotch tape, the uh, crystal clear scotch tape, on the abdomen of the monarch and it removes some of the scales from the butterfly's abdomen 
and you look at it under a microscope and you're able to see the presence or the lack of uh, presence of OE, which is a protozoan parasite that affects uh, monarch health. And then of course, releasing those monarchs. So certain criteria has to be met in the monarch larvae monitoring program. You go through the training program, learn all the uh, different criteria for that program. And then once qualified to do so, submit your application and then you can do that. Um, if you're outside of California, you can participate in monarch tagging through Southwest Monarch Study. Um, you can contact Gail Morris directly to do that. So um, Gail had a lot of, just a lot of statistics, a lot of uh, useful recovery data. Um, so it was really nice to see her speak at the event. Um, right after Gail Morris was Patrick Anthony Guerrera. Patrick Anthony Guerrera is a PhD, University of Cincinnati. Uh, let's see, his uh, presentation was on this or that, examining the orientation and navigational mechanisms of monarchs who migrate from Arizona to overwinter in either California or Mexico. A lot of people are curious, just where are these monarchs going? When are they going? Why are they going? And um, tagging and other methods, and I should emphasize other methods because um, the data being collected on monarchs uh, is really expanding. And it all really comes together, I thought, in one of the very last presentations. Uh, but not to give you a spoiler, you got to listen to the whole series. Um, so he is from University of Cincinnati. He studies the orientation and navigation of monarchs. Pacific Northwest monarchs mostly go southwest to California. Midwest monarchs mostly southwest to central Mexico. Arizona split California and central Mexico. Why? Uh, research is ongoing. Don't have a specific answer to that. I'm not going to put, I am going to put words in his mouth. Why, why would they go to California and central Mexico from Arizona? Well, if you go back to the presentation by uh, Myron Zalecki, uh, he said that monarchs follow rivers and river valleys. So if you follow the geography, I think that answers your question about why Arizona can go to central Mexico uh, because there's no Rocky Mountains preventing them from doing it. So they can go east or west. A lot of flexibility there. Got the contact information for Patrick. Um, I think I had some follow-up questions. I might email him. Uh, he has the Guerrera Lab. Uh, do, do, do. Oh, I got a lot of contact information. Yeah, so his research is um, super focused on monarch migration patterns. So the amount of data that's being collected on monarchs that are migrating is just fascinating. Okay, then we are listening to a presentation from Dr. Francis Villablanca, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Milkweed is not milkweed is not milkweed. And that was, um, the, it looks like kind of a confusing subject, but then he gets into it and gets really interesting. Um, He's kind of, uh, his presentation style was a little bit different. Took some kind of getting used to. So let's see, I got some arrows on my notes and some things like that. Um, so milkweed butterflies, he kind of goes through the, um, not phenology, the, um, well, anyway, the hierarchical structure of uh, milkweed butterflies, um, their scientific names. There are actually... Uh, Daniana that feed on milkweed, Amarinia, Epilemia, Intuinia. All these butterflies coincidentally look very similar to the monarch, and they're all feeding on milkweed. It's really interesting. There's a chemical difference caused by herbivory, not directly a result of monarchs, but all grazing species. Um, Waban. 
so there's chemicals in the milkweed. Um, he's calling them, I think it was maybe this culture, certain culture calls it Waban, O-U-A-B-A-I-N. It's heart medicine. Cardinalides disrupt the sodium potassium pump in basic cellular function. Disruption occurs in all animals. Some show resistance. All of those milkweed butterflies in those four different families have resistant resistance to the disruption that occurs in the sodium potassium pump. And that makes it um, edible, an edible plant for those species. There are 13 cardinalides that are common in milkweeds. He had uh, charts and things like that. I, I don't have that information available to share with you. But just knowing that there's 13 cardinalides in the milkweeds is fascinating. Um, canopy openness over Asclepius fascicularis. Let's see, I've got some 30% with an arrow to 100. Um, I want to read this to you, then I'll share like what it actually means. And then 0.8% egg per plant to 1.3%. And then we got 32% to 100%. At peak heat of 85 degrees, the survival in full sun decreased. All right, so what, is this, what does this mean? Uh, the canopy openness over Asclepius fascicularis. If the canopy is 100% open over Asclepius fascicularis, there are more eggs on those plants. What does canopy openness mean? If it's under a tree, it has fewer eggs on it. So 100% openness is uh, 1.3 eggs per plant. That's above average because everybody says, oh, they only lay one egg on each plant and then they move on. Well, they'll, they'll lay on average well over one egg per plant if it's in a full sun location. However, when the temperatures are extremely high, the egg laying is decreased. So over 85 degrees in the, in, in the sun or in the shade, I guess, but over 85 de degrees and the survival decreases. So basically really hot weather, um, really hot weather. I mean, over 85 degrees is very common, but when it's over 85 degrees, they, they don't survive as well. Um, milkweed, the species, milkweed is a species and, ho and holds the definitions. Um, you can't see this, but I have underlined the S at the end of milkweed. So milkweed is different than milkweeds and definition is different than definitions. It's kind of a metaphorical way of looking at it is when people talk about, oh yeah, the monarchs are on my milkweed. What milkweed is it? It's a family of plants. So you have to look at the entire family and it's really helpful to specify the actual milkweed plant. Milkweed is not milkweed is not milkweed. Those are his closing remarks. And um, at this point, we are towards the um, lunch break. And um, I believe it was essentially during the lunch break, there was uh, s some additional speakers. Um, I forgot to put an explicit rating at the beginning of this episode. So if you're listening to this with children, you want to turn this off right now. Um, because based on my notes, I have to share this with you. Um, the lunchtime speaker was from the Toyota Corporation, and it is uh, Becky Martin, sustainability manager for Toyota and Kelly Bills Parn Pollinator Partnership. Pollinator Partnership, Dedication to Monarchs, Pollinators, and Biodiversity. I think I stepped out for that second part. Toyota Corporation, they are not fucking around. They support sites by identifying sites, planting sites, and maintenance of sites. If you've ever heard me talk about how to care for milkweed in the West, 
I always say identify, preserve, and protect. You need to identify the milkweed that's already there. You can't just go enhancing the location and then find out that it was already covered in milkweed. So identify the milkweed. Uh, preserve that milkweed because if you can't preserve, protect what's already there, why would you want to plant more? And then finally enhance the site. So very similar to what I was recommending, um, they support sites by identifying the sites, planting the sites, and maintenance of the sites. So that's right along the lines of just excellent land stewardship. Um, Toyota has seed grants. They didn't give a lot of detail about this, so I'm going to contact Becky Martin to get some more details about seed grants. Sounds like a pretty cool program. And when I say Toyota's not fucking around, what I was saying is basically Toyota is taking sustainability very seriously throughout their entire corporation. When I was living down in uh, Austin, I became aware of their Toyota plant in San Antonio, and they have a pretty cool pollinator garden down there. Um, a coworker of mine bought a property right across the street from them. I tried to get him to snoop on the location for me, but it never really panned out. So I'm not exactly sure what that site looks like besides uh, the Toyota website, um, corporate um, information that they've disseminated on the internet and through social media channels and stuff like that. But basically, uh, I mean, Toyota doesn't just have butterfly um, gardens at their facilities. They, they're also actively participating in engaging with the community for um, pollinator enhancement, which is really cool. So um, it is lunch break. Um, I could go into our afternoon session right now, but I think I'm going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a little bit about home germination of milkweed plants. So I talked about germination briefly. Just the other day, I was uh, browsing YouTube and a notification came up about germination. And there was a wonderful video on germination. And so I'm going to give you the audio from that video. I reached out to the, the producer of this video and she's very graciously um, giving me permission to rebroadcast the audio. She's really well spoken about this. If you have any questions about germination, I'll give you some more details about where you can download um, a file, PDF file, so that you can do germination in your own property. But uh, that'll be after the break. Thank you for sticking around. I now present Dana from Lumberjill Garden YouTube channel on germination. Hey friends, thanks for tuning in to Lumberjill Garden. Today I'm going to be showing you how to germinate milkweed in a jar without any stratification time. And that's the best part of this method because stratification can take anywhere from a whole winter to a month in the refrigerator and when it gets to be springtime like it is right now you probably don't have that much time to wait for these little guys to sprout in order to have a beautiful butterfly garden so i found this method online where you actually clip the seeds and put them in water for one to three days and then you can actually just have them sprout right inside this jar so these have been in here for about two weeks and as you can see we already have some lovely little plants, which I'll transplant soon. Um, and really this was the most satisfying way of starting milkweed in my opinion, because you get milkweed really, really fast and they're gonna be ready to transplant as soon as spring gets its way to Tennessee. So I will first show you all the materials that you need. So of course you need some milkweed seeds. These ones are already um, taken out of their, their little pods. So in a different video, I tell you all about how to do that most efficiently. Um, you'll need a little jar of water that is filtered. You don't want any chlorine in this water. Um, and then you'll need a 16 ounce ball jar or whatever kind of canning jar you have. This one in particular has a really wide mouth. 
Um, and that's important because if it's necked in, the little plants are gonna, aren't gonna be able to find their way out. Uh, let's see, you also need some saran wrap. Here it is. Um, that'll cover the top of the jar and make a little greenhouse for you until they start to get big. Um, and then I have a knife so that I can drill some holes or poke some holes. Um, you'll need a little lid cap for your jar to hold that cellophane on. Um, the last thing I have is this stuff called coconut core, which helps hold the uh, moisture in, and I'll put that on top of the seeds. So all of these things will be in a list below, which you can reference before you get planting. Um, but for now, I'm looking around to see if I missed anything. Of course, I had some uh, nail clippers too. That is probably the most unusual piece that you will see in this planting. Um, we're actually gonna be clipping the seeds with this little guy. So any little thing that can clip seeds is fine, but I like this nail clipper, it's working really well. So um, yeah, I think that's everything and I'll get to it. I will show you exactly how this works in just a minute. All right, so the first step is to clip these tiny little seeds. What I'm gonna do here is as you can see, the seed has a round end and a little flat end on it. And the flat end is where the seeds begins to emerge when it, it germinates or the little plant. And what I'm gonna show you how to do today is how to clip the little end off so that the seed germ is exposed, which you can't really see there and you probably won't be able to see. But what happens when it hits water, which I'll put it in this little cup, is that that water starts to penetrate that little hole and the little plant will start coming out. And that is how we are moving past germination or um, stratification. Let's see, there's another one. I'll do about five more and you can see how I do each one. cut into the meat of it just a little bit so that it exposes what's inside. I found that to be a fairly effective method. One more. And that. Let's see, let's do one more. There we go. And I'll keep on doing this until I have about 20 seeds. And then um, these ones are, have already been sitting there for a while. And then after a day, I'll change the water out and I'll let these go for about three days. And as you can see, this little white part, trying to get focused, the little white part is starting to emerge from the seed. There we go tough to see there, but that is a little milkweed plant that is going to eventually come out. So once you have them soaked for one to three days, for this little guy here, I only soaked these ones for one day, and they did really well. Uh, three days helps get more of them ready. But once they're ready to go, once you've had your three days of soaking about, you can get your jar ready. All I did was put plain miracle Grow um, soil in here. This is a 16 ounce jar. And in 16 ounces, I'll put a half a cup of filtered water. So there we go. Pour that in there and make that super moist. Put that in there evenly. There we go. Very nice. And then all I do is I take these seeds that have started to grow and I'll one by one place them on top of the soil. They get a little sticky. Don't worry about them clumping too much. Just try to get them all in there. Once I transplant them, I'll give them more space, but initially they can have a neighbor sometimes. So I'll put 10 or 20 in here actually give everything a good chance to grow and become a full size milkweed plant. 
keep going. Oh, there's some on the bottom. Sometimes when I get a little tired, I might just pour the water out like that. There we go. And then I'll just take the extra and pour them in there <laughs> and spread them out. It's a little too futzy for me sometimes. That's when you get kind of some of the clumps, but as you see, I just spread them around and they're pretty happy in there as they are. I make sure they have good contact with the soil. And this is where they're gonna do the rest of their germinating. And then to finish, I give them a little bit of a blanket of the coconut core, like I mentioned. So this will help them retain moisture and it'll protect the seeds. And this is the key to success. So we have planted our seeds. Now we're just gonna make the greenhouse out of it by putting the cellophane on top, securing it with the ring. If you don't have a ring, you can use a um, rubber band or it might just stay put on its own. Um, and then I just poke a few holes, just like you would if there was an insect living in there. And that'll just make sure that it's properly vented. Look at that. All right. And this is our greenhouse. So this is called germination. Um, and like I said, it's the most effective way to get some little plants started in a really quick time, especially when it comes to milkweed. And I'm gonna be starting a whole bunch of these this year. That's my plan. So I can share all sorts of milkweed. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments or um, email me at lumberjillgarden at gmail.com. I would love to hear how things go for you and see wonderful photos of your beautiful milkweed. Thank you so much for learning with me and um, please subscribe to my channel and we will give you more beautiful milkweed tutorials. All right, bye. I don't think I could have said that better myself. Dana from Lumberjill Gardens. I'm going to post, obviously, this video link in the show notes, give you a chance to subscribe to Lumberjill Garden YouTube channel because she's producing some killer content about growing milkweed and helping the pollinators. This episode and every episode is brought to you by GrowMilkweedPlants.com, your source for premium milkweed seeds. Be sure to subscribe to be notified of all new episodes. Thank you for listening to episode 53 of Grow Milkweed Plants podcast.